hard time uh, in God's triune name and then was saved. So we begin this morning in the triune name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we begin singing together praise to the Lord, the Almighty. From the rising of the sun unto the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. The Lord is exalted over the nations, his glory above the heavens. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's sing.
Father in heaven, you have uh, graciously bestowed on each one of your creatures um, the human beings which you have created, uh, male and female, you have placed on us uh, the image of you. And though that image is marred by sin and selfishness and brokenness, both in our humanity and in our own actions and lives, it is uh, a life and an image that you have sent your son Jesus into the world to redeem, to sanctify, and to make holy once again. By his incarnation, uh, his life, his suffering, his death and his resurrection, he has called each one of us to see again and anew in one another the living and active image of God. Help us by hearing your holy word today to hold sacred in our own hearts and minds the lives that you have given us uh, personally and also the lives of those who you have placed around us. Help us to defend life. Help us to help life flourish uh, through caring for one another, providing one another's needs and defending of one another's lives. Just as you have sent your son into the world to live, die, and rise again for us, may we lay out down our lives as well for the lives of others. It's in your holy name. We're going to be seated for a reading of God's Word this morning. Our first reading comes from Psalm 139, uh, a really magnificent psalm uh, that meditates on God's intimate knowledge of our lives uh, and meditates on our inability to ever escape um, from out of God's sight or of His knowledge. And also um, is one of the more beautiful passages in scripture as well uh, that meditates on the intent and the intentionality that God placed into each human creature um, as well. So, so 139 verses 1 through 18. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before, and you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit, and where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, and how vast are some of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through 26. And this is the Apostle Paul's teaching about the body of Christ um, in the church. And within this teaching is a great little passage of scripture that teaches uh, the Christian church never to see the weaker parts of the body as lesser, but to hold them 
as more valuable, actually. He actually flips the script and says those who are weaker and frailer are the parts of the body of believers that are the most important in their lives. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Yet the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the, uh, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack them, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then our final reading comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Here we see Jesus, um, or we see people bringing Jesus uh, to or bring the, the ch bring the children to Jesus, and um, and Jesus welcoming them and then rebuking those who would try to withhold them uh, from coming. Mark ten verses thirteen to sixteen. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's confess our faith uh, together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christy, can we sing both songs, actually? Can we sing Father Welcomes as well? So we'll sing Father Welcomes, and then immediately after that, we'll sing Speak, O Lord, and we'll hear us.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So each January, uh, many churches observe uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday, uh, which we do as well every every year. Uh, we observe Sanctity of Life Sunday, uh, which is always in um, in kind of like a direct protest or direct uh, contrast to um, the Roe v. Wade decision of the 1970s um, that legalized abortion in the United States. Ever since then, church, uh, churches have saw fit to have um, at least one Sunday where they speak about that subject and the opposing doctrine of the, of the church and of Orthodox Christianity that sanctifies all human life from its very smallest to its very oldest forms. Um, and to be honest, I have like a bit of a love-hate and rela relationship with Sanctity of Life Sunday. Um, don't get me wrong, it is a, it's a joy for me to preach the whole counsel of God. Uh, like Paul says to Timothy, where he tells him, hey, don't ever shy away from any subject or any topic that the Word of God clearly teaches on. Uh, we should gladly and willingly preach and teach those in all uh, and any circumstances where they are called for. And of course, it's not that I think uh, the sanctity of Human Life Sunday is somehow unbiblical. Uh, to the contrary, the entire canon of Scripture is filled with God's commitment to the fatherless and to the widow, uh, and his wrath is filling the scriptures towards those who shed innocent blood. And the affirmation uh, throughout that all of human life in every single form is holy um, is replete all throughout scripture. Um, even if you just consider the basic readings that we had Today, it's a very good uh, cross-section across the Old Testament, the New Testament letters and teachings, and then also um, the Gospels themselves. Okay, so you have, for example, Psalm 139, which is a meditation in the Psalms on the preciousness and intention that God puts into every single human life and not just the human lives that we can see, but the human lives even in their most nascent forms in the womb. So you have words like, uh, you knit me together uh, in my mother's womb. You created my inmost being. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's not just like a fancy meditation that the psalmist has, but that's a teaching from scripture about not only how the psalmist should see his own life, but life in general. Um, it, it tells us that when we don't see or understand the processes that lead to life, God does. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's the scriptures teaching you and I how we should think about and consider the importance of human life, which is really beautiful. I mean, like, um, modern technology has given us deep insights into how the human person is formed inside the womb of a mother and has made it even, uh, even more, like, you know, wonderful and awesome. But even thousands of years ago, they somehow, through the revelation of God, knew that a child was like, you know, like a, 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 a blanket woven together in all of its little in intricacies. Think about the intentionality that it takes to make a, a quilt or a blanket or a sweater and how you sit there very intentionally and think about every single move and every single part and piece. That's what it says God is doing inside the womb of a mother with a child and that should inspire awe in us and wonder and also uh, a holiness to that process. The Apostle Paul teaches us, you know, what I, you know, people, when it comes to like a, a, like sanctity of life kind of verses, this is actually one of my very favorite ones. 
where the Apostle Paul is talking about the body of Christ. And he's talking about how, like, you know, every body is made up of various parts. And you have kind of like the more glorious parts of the body, like the eyes and the hands and the biceps. And, you know, just like the, the things that do a lot of the heavy lifting that you think, like, oh, these are parts of the body that are really great. The voice, the mouth, the ears, um, the head. But there are parts of the body that are sort of like, you know, not as glamorous. Like nobody really says like, what's the pinnacle of the human body? The pinky toe, right? Um, or your ankle, or like you know, like it, it it just doesn't it just doesn't hold up compared to the eye. And there's the inclination to think that one might be important, more important than other, or, or to create like a hierarchy in regards to. Uh, the human body um, and, and the body of believers likewise. Um, but the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 no. You flip the whole thing on its head. And the parts of the body that people think are less important are actually the very most important. Um, and that is not only true for the physical body, but it's, it's true for, it should be true for the Christian church, and it should be true for the way that God designed the world, that as the world and as we as the church look at the body of believers, you could easily think to say like, oh, you know, some of the most kind of productive members of the church, those are the people who are most important. Uh, the less productive or the less talented, the less gifted or something like that, maybe less important. But I think that's exactly the opposite. I think the churches are inherently defined by how they care for their smallest members, and their oldest numbers. That's what really makes a church in, in, in many ways. Uh, it's not that you don't care for the others, but a church that looks at its smallest and youngest members and holds them as dear and precious, and looks at the weakest and frailest members and holds them as the dearest and precious, most precious and most important, that will inherently define the rest of the way that that community lives. Okay? Um, and that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. When he says, if uh, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Indispensable. Okay? That's, a, that's a beautiful way of thinking about the value of human life. And also the solidarity that we have with all of human life that suffers as well. It, we see that as we're tied in one body. In verse 26, when the Apostle Paul says, if one part of the body suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That you should see your life tied up with everybody else's life in the community of the Christian church. And even within your own nation, too, and within your own world. Like in our nation, this is why the things that... Uh, Congress will legislate matter to us as a church, and why we look and when when, uh, when when Congress or um, or legislative branches of the government will will allow things that God forbids. Why we say, hey, no, no, that's not just bad for me. That's bad for everybody. That's not just bad for children. That's bad for everyone. That's not just bad for the elderly. That's bad for everybody. It's like the it's like the poem. I can't remember the author where he says, if a clod of England were to be swept away into the sea, England is of the less for it. That's the image that we should have as the body of Christ as well. Or you have Jesus' own words and own teachings that when children are brought to him, he not only welcomes them, but rebukes his own disciples for trying to hinder them coming. Now, the reason that they are, the reason that the disciples, if you're wondering, the reason that the disciples are uh, kind of trying to withhold the, the children from being brought to Jesus is because generally in the society of the New Testament, their the children were not at all held in high regard. Uh, not at all. Um, they were seen as lesser, both intellectually and physically and production-wise and economically. They, they, were, they were kind of the parasites of, uh, of, of the world, and they needed to grow up 
and become productive members of society, then they would be seen as having kind of honor and worth. And so them being brought to Jesus was like of, of, of questionable practice. Why should Jesus, this great and worthy and awesome teacher, be bothered by children who have nothing to offer him? They can't provide for him, they can't protect him, they can't do anything for uh, Jesus at all. And so they say, you know, hold off on the kids. We're wasting Jesus' time. He has better things to do. There's a man over there that needs to be healed. We don't have time for kids right now. But you notice how strong Jesus' language is when he speaks him. He says, but he rebuked his disciples, which means he chewed them out when he saw this and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And you would think that that would be enough, just like a firm rebuke and saying like, hey, these guys belong here just as much as everybody else. But not only does he do that, but he flips it on his head like the Apostle Paul does. And he says, truly I tell you, disciples, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So he not only says, don't hold the children back from coming to me, but he says, if you want to have a part with me, you need to be one of them, which inherently means that you've got to value them. Okay? I got a really beautiful uh, text of scripture. So, I mean, the scriptures are full, full. The full counsel of God speaks to the sanctity of human life. So I don't have a problem with talking about uh, having a sanctity of human life Sunday um, on a, you know, on, uh, in, in a given year, but I still feel divided about it. I don't think it's inappropriate either. To the contrary, just as every Sunday should be uh, Christmas in some ways, where we remember and recall Jesus' incarnation, right? Like there's never a bad day or a bad time to recall that Jesus came in the flesh for you and I, remembering Christmas. There's, not, there's never a, a wrong day for that. And just like every Sunday should recall Good Friday, the day where Jesus laid down his life for you and I. There's never a bad time to remember that. And just like every Sunday and every day should recall Easter, the day that Jesus conquered death and rose from the tomb uh, to life eternal. There's never a bad day to remember that. So every Lord's Day should be a high, uh, should highlight the dignity and the worth of human life. There's never a Sunday. Like every, every Sunday should be sanctity of human life Sunday. Okay? By nature of Jesus' life, death, and, in, uh, and, and resurrection. If Christ was willing to take on human flesh and gives his life as a ransom for it, then certainly it is worth more than we could ever imagine. Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter all testify to the intrinsic value of human life. But instead, the reason that I have mixed feelings about Sanctity of Life Sunday is that it reminds us that we are constantly having to say things to one another that human beings shouldn't have to say. That children shouldn't die. That fathers and mothers should not abandon their responsibilities or the precious gift that they've been given in their children. That communities shouldn't uh, disregard hurting families or parents or children in need. That we should never grow callous to the loneliness and suffering of the sick and the elderly. These are things we shouldn't have to say. Right? That no human life is worthless regardless of their skin color or uh, uh, our age or disability uh, or race or economic status. The very fact that these things must be proclaimed is a reminder of the tragedy of the present darkness that we live in. And that's why I'm divided. That's what makes me split mind. Right? That's what makes every, every uh, sanctity of human life Sunday challenging for me. The kingdom tells us that uh, it tells us who and what matters, and this isn't determined by strength or force of will. Our world bases the value of an individual, generally speaking, on their economic output and convenience. It decides viability based on how much it costs the system to sustain life and how much it costs people personally to sustain life. But you'll note that the scriptures would teach us 
that none of us is viable in and of ourselves alone. We may be tempted to see the vulnerable, whether it's the unborn or the aged or the poor or the diseased or the disabled or the abused or the orphan, and see them as, dis as the disadvantaged. But in the long run, they are not. They are the sons and the daughters whom God delights to make the future rulers of the universe. Even in our intro today, we, we say, uh, he raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and with the princes of their people. Right? Now that's what God does to the lowly. Okay? Throughout the whole gospel narrative, from Pharaoh to Herod, the enemies of God consistently carry, carry out a murderous wrath on the innocent. Such attacks are not merely dramatic scenes in scripture or something like that, but they are pictures of the ongoing spiritual warfare that denigrates the value and worth of every human life. And it's a warfare that ultimately continues to this day. And moments like Sanctity of Life Sunday are reminders that the culture of death still wages war and that we as Christian people wage war against it. That's why it grieves me. It grieves me because it reminds me uh, of, of babies that never got to see the light of day. It reminds me uh, that there are children um, uh, blocks away, and families, and the poor and destitute throughout our own community who are, uh, who are devalued and seen as not viable uh, or worth uh, life. But I also love Sanctity of Life Human Sunday, or Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, when I think about um, the ex-orphans, uh, the mothers and fathers who courageously bear children, uh, and uh, families that adopt and bring, uh, bring children into their homes, uh, people who reach out to the hurting mothers and fathers, the elderly and those who are diseased and downtrodden and sick and poor, and say, your life is worth great value because Jesus said it was. And I love to see, I love Sanctity of Life Humans, or Sanctity of Human Life Sunday when I see men and women who walk in the forgiveness of sins washed in uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ teaches us that what the world wants to make invisible, he desires to make indispensable. And so my prayer regularly uh, for my children and future grandchildren uh, is that Sanctity of Human Life Sunday would one day uh, be as unnecessary as like a reality of gravity emphasis Sunday. We all need Christmas, we all need Good Friday, we all need Easter, but I pray that someday we will not need Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Would you join me? Father in heaven, you have made precious the life of each individual. But we are, uh, we are at odds with uh, a, a dark world that does not see uh, the full value of human life. May we be people who proclaim, defend, and who live uh, the value of each and every human life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We sing our, um, our hymn, You Are the Way, the Truth, and Life.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's sing together our closing song. Roxanne's going to play the flute again. Uh, we'll sing together, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Thank you.